Welcome to Happy Hour, a Scripps Gone Wild spinoff where we sit down with the folks who help make our reads happen, shoot the shit, drink a little, whatever floats our boat, never know what's going to happen. And today we are here with an actress and a stunt person. And um, is it fair to say activist? Yeah, I think that's legit. I think that's fair to say activist. Alex Marshall Brown. Alex, welcome. Hey there. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to start off by just saying, I don't know if you know this, but I was doing the numbers the other day just for the sheer fun of it. And in terms of people overall who have done reads with us, you are technically in second place. There are two people tied for first place. Wait, no. So that means I'm third. Well, what? Technically, <laughs> you're technically behind... Aaron and Rico. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So how far behind? How like what am I looking at? Can I pull a pounce on this? What do I do? You're two reads behind. Oh, okay. Yeah. How many do they have on the docket? Uh, Rico <laughs> and Aaron are currently tied at 15. Okay. Okay. Do they have any scheduled? Uh yes. Rico has three in a row coming. <laughs> what? What? Okay, so you are absolutely making me third as we speak. All right, so so I think we should do something about that. <laughs> well, there were, Rico was on a streak recently where he was in like seven in a row. Uh huh. <laughs> so that's kind of what did it for him was just that streak. Aaron's been a little a little splotchier, but. <laughs> all um, right, all right. Now I know. But you're in fine company. You're in fine company up at the top. Thank you. Up at the top. Excellent. Th this is true. I feel. I feel good about myself. <laughs> so I'm going to start off by asking a question, which is probably the most recent in my mind, but you've had an interesting month. I've had an interesting two weeks. Yes. Yeah, uh, you had an interesting couple weeks. Uh, for, yeah. for folks who don't know, I'll just summarize and say that you, uh, you were in North Hollywood, uh, chillaxing on a stretch of lawn outside of a Lutheran church. I'm the black woman that sat in the grass next to a church. That's, yes. that's, that is now what I have been branded, and here I am. Hello. You're the, <laughs> you're the Rosa Parks of North Hollywood. Ain't that something. <laughs> and, and so essentially you were there minding your own business, and then um, I guess the people who were representing the church at the time didn't like that, so they called the cops, and the cops tried to get you to leave, and you were like, I'm just chilling. And then so shortly thereafter, the folks who represent the church came out with like a legit no trespassing sign and were like, Actual. here you go, here you go. And um, kind of has gotten some attention, I think, which makes sense considering. Considering the heart and the system behind it was inherently racist. Yes, it did get the, the attention that it deserved. Um, and it is, I, it's a rough thing to have your whole world turn sideways because you sat somewhere. Yeah. That is an unusual thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I did not enjoy going through it. Um, I am not pleased by much of it. I am hopeful that there is a chance to find a resolution with the church that allows for growth for all of us is what I'm really hoping for ultimately. Um, but now that I'm here, so grateful to be like on a path that is purposefully motivated towards something that I really do care about. And I really do feel as though if we can uh, encourage the systems that exist within the church to be less reflective of its uh, roots, the roots being originating in white supremacy and patriarchy, yeah. if we can go ahead and, and cleanse that out of, out of the church and find a way to redevelop a moral compass in terms of the actions and offer mental wellness initiatives for people um, affiliated therein and offer and wonder why, how come there aren't, how come there are tax exemptions for the church in service to their community if they are not applying those funds to the people literally across the street? Yeah. Um, so there's, it's, it's opened up a, a whole lot of questions that are, I think, worth investigating. So I'm curious about this because I had an interesting journey with, with that video myself, just in terms yeah, of- Yeah, tell me about it. I'd love to know. When I watched it and then I, I've been, and I've been like reflecting on the way I reacted to it as well. Because when I first watched the video, I mean, keep in mind, I went into this with like a knowledge of like knowing you, knowing that you are a responsible, right. honest, stable human being. And like- Thank you. I appreciate yes, that. Yes. And, <laughs> and so 
But that said, even going into it with that, I'll be honest, the first thing I thought of when I watched the video, the first thing before I even finished the video, before I even get, I started thinking, I was like, well, I started making sort of excuses. And I was like, okay. I was like, well, yeah, but it's attached to a school and it's part of a church and the parks across, the, like I was literally making those things and I was like, and then it got to the point in the video where the dude is like, all lives matter. And I yeah. was like, oh, like, okay. Like now I get what this is about. So like, right. yeah, like now I get what this is about. And then, and then, you know, then there's a part in the video where this woman comes up and starts talking to you as well. And, mm -hmm. and my, when I first watched that part, even, even when I first watched it, I was like, oh, well, she's sweet. She's trying to diffuse the situation. She's all this. And then I watched right. it again and I was like, she, no, she's like, it's like, no, she's like kind of talking down to her and like, like treating her like a child. And like, it was, I don't know. I just had such a journey with it where it started off with me like making ra what I thought were rational excuses and then being like, no. And then looking at it more and more, it's like, no, like it's pretty obvious what's going on here. This is so fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing that with me because I, I've had several friends who pointed out to me that they had to watch it several times in order to to understand the perspective with which I was experiencing it. Yeah. Um, but they absolutely were uh, very well supported in the systems of authority that have always been there and relying on those systems to forcibly remove me from their property. Yeah. Um, and it is tale as old as time but also something that we've been saying doesn't exist in America anymore. And racism runs prevalent all the time, yeah. everywhere. And it's that covert. It runs, it like runs just beneath the surface of everything. And I, I am grateful finally for the national conversation about it because there are a lot of people who like you've watched it many times and still don't understand yeah. how that, that situation was problematic who will rely on your first response watching on it, saying, well, technically she wasn't supposed to be there or trying to give any kind of defenses or excuses like that. And that is that is a deflection away from the real root of the problem that we need to investigate as Americans. Yeah, and I just kept, I, watching it more and more, I kept thinking about like, there were so many ways, like if, like, here, if they had a legitimate reason for like wanting if there had been a legitimate sign yeah. if there had been any indication that i shouldn't have been there before they like sent said, authority figures to remove me yeah and like you said to even to them like they could have come out and night and had a nice conversation with you they could have come out and been like you know we've had issues here like it's one of those right things where like we just don't want we don't want one person doing because if everybody's going to think that they can like there's so many ways they that would have been, been different if they were concerned about the precedent but then also that whole, like, I see a lot of people commenting on it, like people who are, you know, siding with the church, I guess, who are commenting with like, well, yeah, but there's a lot of homeless in that area and all this. And then I, a part of me even thinks on that, it was like, well, it's a church. Should they be removing that's, homeless people from their, from their lawns? Like they're a church. Like that's what they're and not only, I mean, not only removing people from their lawn, but also reaching out to the person saying, I'm so sorry this is private property and, and technically this is not a space that we can go ahead and help you but like as a church and as a sanctuary and as a space to go ahead and make you feel welcome and make you feel safe we have this other area available yeah. or we have this program that's available or at the very least here's a bottle of water that i can give you as i send you on your way have some sort of charitable compassion yeah as a church yeah to take care of the people who literally live across the street yeah and their and their their, their response was generally just we'll go to the park you belong at the park it's what it seems right. like go you to don't the belong you here yeah and which is the an antithesis of what a church is supposed to do in, it in felt general. very much like a slap of a placing a colored sign over the church and straight out of civil rights america it's very familiar but it's good. I mean, it, what's positive about it, though, hopefully, is that they are, there at least seems to be some sort of a dialogue, I'm guessing, from them. Which I'm so grateful. Yeah. There's a dialogue with them, but more than that, there's a dialogue among people in the world, because this yeah. now became a global conversation about why are the systems that exist in place at all? Where do they come from? And it's I am oddly grateful for a pandemic and for this unfortunate phase of unemployment. If only it means that we have a lot of people who are who can devote some attention to these things that have been needing attention for ever since the beginning. Yeah. So 
it's it's an unfortunate way to get there, but I'm glad we're talking about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I certainly think it's helpful. Like, I mean, especially like you said, like now when people have so much downtime, in a sense, to like right. it, it, it may. I mean, I, I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and we were talking about why it seems so much more urgent and so much more like mm -hmm. in in the zeitgeist now than it has previously and that's exactly why it is because people are home people are not having to go to work right. people are not having to be consumed with all these other things they're able to focus their attention on something i hope that when this clears out and you know COVID is trickling away and we're kind of going back to reality that maybe that mentality sticks around hopefully well we are notoriously forgetful as a population yeah. Um, and so I think we should be uh, preparing ourselves with the possibility that we will be inclined to go back to the rat race and forget. Yeah. Um, and I think we should actively create systems now and acknowledge now and set boundaries for ourselves now so that whenever the economy comes and slaps us in the face again, we can look at it with confidence and say, I acknowledge that you want me to go back to what it was, but what it was was not normal and I need yeah. this to be new and different. We need to go back to a new system that is conscientious and considerate of like our individual self-care, conscious and considerate of building, rebuilding family values and making time for family in the way that is healthy for everyone, but offers quality time and a chance for like the unit to grow as a whole. Yeah. And also with a, awareness of our community as a whole, because people in quarantine all of a sudden are really getting to know their neighbors. Yeah. Realizing that they have people who have been a wall away all of this time. And so, Rather than rushing back to our emails, I, I would like to think that coming out of this, we can set firm standards with our places of employment and say, as a, as a quality of life measure, I need this for myself and establish firm boundaries before rushing back to make the money that everyone feels as though they've lost. Because that is going to ultimately be more important as we fight all the other battles down the road. Yeah. And I... I keep hearing a lot of people say that what you just said, which is like, let's get back to normal. And I'm I'm in the exact same mentality. It was not normal. There's the old phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It was broke. It was broken all along it was broke from the very beginning. Time. Yeah. And so like this idea, I, what you said about community is important too, because like I, I go, when I go, I go on a walk, the only time I leave my house essentially is to go get exercise every day because I'm one Good of on you. afraid of COVID shut-ins. But there's a, I've got a neighbor who's a few blocks away, but on their corner, for the whole pandemic, they've been putting boxes of like homemade postcards out with like these notes oh. asking people to like eat, like to send to their loved ones. And like, I and, love that idea. Yeah. And they have a table out there too where they just have stacks of books that they're like, take any book you want. If you want to bring one, bring one. Yeah. Like, it, that kind of thing is just not something that happens anymore. And so, like, to see mm -hmm. that kind of thing happening is like, I want more of this. Like, this is what's great like let's have more of this and less of like like the horrible i mean like class structure that has dominated for so long that is like the the i mean that's what the problem is for i think the majority of america is just this horrible class structure that's been in place since the very beginning exactly it's a horrible crap uh, class structure and the people who are in the upper strata of that class system want us to get back to work as soon as possible so that yeah. we can keep trying to feed the corporate beast yeah. and corporations are also part of the problem they are also supported by white supremacy and also supported by the patriarchy and so we should be firm as we establish our own personal boundaries as a community because there's strength in numbers yeah. there's power in that in exerting what a healthy economy actually looks like for all of us and not just the economy that the people who are sitting comfortably on their golden toilets want yeah yeah I, where are you where are you from where were you born and raised uh, this is a segue into another question solid segue <laughs> um i was born in washington dc i never lived there two weeks after i was born i was living in jamaica because that was the first posting that my dad had in his in the Foreign Service. Yeah. Says he was a diplomat working for the State Department. I'm curious, have you ever lived in the South at all? I have. Uh, I used to. I, I went to high school and college in North Carolina. Okay, I thought I thought I thought you had. That was my segue. I just couldn't remember which state. Yeah. I, I'm curious, and this relates to this conversation too. 
about your experience with racism in the different places where you've lived because I grew up in the South. I grew up in the Bible Belt, like a very- Yes, I know all about it. As I've told folks before, like I grew up like a mile away from a a, a Confederate supply store that every year would say, celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, Confederate flags half off. Like a mile from where I grew up. So very, very rooted in in that sort of racism. Now that said, I, I spent a lot of my years in Birmingham, which okay. is, you know, is notorious for being like the civil rights capital of the country in terms of like right. in the 60s, how prevalent the racism was there. But now to me is sort of a progressive beacon in the middle of this really iffy state. But all that said, I'm curious about you because- You said I, iffy. Iffy. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So um, I-, I I always thought, man, I live in the most racist place in the world. I'll be honest with you, mm. I, I have experienced more overt racism since I moved to California than Tell I've me ever more. experienced in Alabama. Fascinating. And Tell me more. Two days, two days. Da- I'll say this. I lived in Birmingham for 12 years. I never once heard anybody in Birmingham drop the N-bomb. Not once. Okay. Not once in any of my interactions with them. Two days in California, I was in an Uber. Two days in California, I was in an Uber within five minutes drops it driver drops it and i'm okay. like and and i don't and i and i think sometimes like did he drop it because my name is billy ray and that i have a southern mm. accent and like he thought he could drop it or is that just something that you know he just drops all the time that's an interesting question uh because i think that there's uh I mean, there's clearly a degree of tribalism involved right now where people are trying to find their people. And like, that is a clear divisive way to figure out, are you on my side or not on my side? Dropping the N-word is a clear indicator of that. It is either, are you on my team or you're definitely not on my team when people use it. Yeah. Um, And uh, I have never gotten that impression from you. You've been delightful, Billy Ray. (laughs) (laughs) I have never questioned whether you were an ally or support the cause and I appreciate it, homie. (laughs) Um, uh, but it, it's interesting like people keep trying to ask, say people a lot of people have acknowledged that if they had been the one to sit in the lawn or sit in the grass by that church that they would not have been asked to leave there are people who tell me that they have done that before they've sat in the grass there with their children or by themselves and no one came to bother them at all and yeah. so when you consider uh, the defense that there has been a concern about the homeless community. I know that the homeless are both black and white. So yeah. that also feels like an additional layer to why I shouldn't have been there in their eyes. Um, so it, uh, it has been a fascinating national analysis of the people's psyche in terms of how they process people around them, yeah. how they self identify and how they identify with the people who they share space with. Yeah. Um, and it's it's racism is the kind of thing that is so deeply ingrained in our traditions and in our systems and our day-to-day life that i'm sure that there's a lot of people who don't know how they express the racism in this country yeah um and i've tried to uh introduce a, a new perspective in terms of racism because i i realize it's such an easy trigger people are so reactive and it's a very volatile word to a lot of people i acknowledge yeah. that because it has such a fraught history. But I'm trying to invite people as they engage in so many difficult conversations to uh, to receive the possibility that if someone says that you are racist, recalibrate what that means in your mind. It is not an attack, it is not a jacuzzi, it is not an opportunity to shame you. Yeah. Far from it, I have no interest in shaming anyone in this moment. I want only to build more awareness to a problem that we all have the agency to solve. And so it is not that you're racist, you're bad, condemned. It is more along the lines of this is a moment for self-assessment and self-awareness. Yeah. And so you have, you have presented something in your actions or in your words that is received as racist by others. And if you don't want to present as racist to the people that you coexist with, then hear us when we say potentially you shouldn't use the n-word and you shouldn't ask about our hair and the ways that it can be um an affront there are ways and i acknowledge that people are going to make mistakes through this and that's okay like there is no i am not wishing guilt or shame in anyone as people learn 
it's a learning process yeah. and that's the willingness to learn is what matters more than anything at all yeah so if people present things that are racist and people call them out for presenting racist there's no reason to take offense to it. It's an opportunity to listen. It's an opportunity to learn. And it's an opportunity to grow in our ability to be an ally through this process. Because I'm pretty sure that everyone wants to live in an anti-racist society. Because that's the only one where it minimizes fear, it minimizes anger and rage, it minimizes, uh, it minimizes violence, ultimately, yeah. if we are all cohabitating in a way that is respectful of everyone else. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think what helps is having an entire group of people not justifiably feeling like the cards are stacked against them. Right. Like, and I want everyone to be able to feel that way. Yeah, like just yeah. because I, I, I imagine that, um, I imagine that there are, uh, there are white allies who are fighting their own guilt at their awareness of their history in this country. And it's not their personal history, it is a, a awareness of their own heritage in this country. Um, and how our shared mutual history is intertwined, but also really, really ugly in how we got to here. And, which is also me trying to say, there's no reason to absorb the guilt because clearly you didn't do anything directly and intentionally to get us to here. And, and so there's no reason for me to blame you for your actions. But there is a moral obligation, as soon as you are aware of how things are, to offer your assistance in doing something to help change it for the better. And that is not an insurmountable effort. Again, we all do it as a community and as a group. And as long as, as we pursue that effort with intention and with respect and with compassion, uh, we can unravel the knot of our past and try to do good. Yeah. It is not a, a loss of that privilege is not a reflection of white oppression. It is, it is an opportunity to help heal what we all are going through because white people, black people, everybody in this country is victim to white supremacist patriarchy. Yeah. And it is, it is something that we can liberate all of us from with concerted active effort in the dismantlement thereof. Well, and I think that's part of it too, is I think, I think the defensive reaction that a lot of white people get is, mm. is almost, I feel like a lot of white people feel almost as if their entire existence and way of being is being attacked when it's not. It's but I don't, not. what they don't realize, I don't think, is that white supremacy has done, I mean, obviously not just as much, but has done a fair amount to oppress white people too. Like I think about my Absolutely. state, Alabama, I think about the white supremacists who have like ran that state for so many years. That doesn't just affect the black citizens, that affects the white citizens, it affects the Hispanic citizens, it affects everybody. So it's, I mean- White supremacy tries to control power. Yeah. They tr control power by the money and the finances that they can milk the populace for, of. Yeah. And, and so anyone who's in a position of power that also controls the money, will try to constrain everyone below them and oppress them and keep them from taking their power. And so white supremacy uses the excuse of black people to vilify and finds a way to coerce uh, lower status white people into believing that they are just as wealthy as they are when they're not. Yeah. They are equally oppressed as the black people and are just so angry by their oppression that they don't want to feel like they are existing that way. So they have a scapegoat in black bodies yeah but really it's the people in power who control the money who try to control the way we vote and who try to control the way we live and who try to make us feel like a normal way of life is beating ourselves down in service to making them more money they're the problem yeah and so it is it is redirecting our attention to the problem and just because they want to stay quiet and expect us to forget even though the church has completely shut down and won't engage in discussions with me or anybody else and are hoping that so much new stuff happens that we'll forget that this ever happened. Yeah. We have to make sure that there's a constant dialogue as we continually remind them, hey, you are still designed at your core to be white supremacist and to be patriarchal. And if you aren't doing anything to correct that path, then yeah. you aren't building toward the anti-racist future that we all can live in. 
and that's an indicator that you are abusing the power in your control. And uh, I need more and more of the public to acknowledge that they can't abide by that. Yeah. yeah. It hurts all of us. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit right now because I do want to yeah, get. Yeah, man. I want to get. I want to get into the actor part of your hyphenate. Sure. <laughs> I got a lot of hyphens, you're right. <laughs> a lot of hyphens are good. That's a good thing. Um, Thank you. So I think when I first got introduced to you through uh, Emily Carmichael. Yes. Shout out to Emily. Um, Rock on. I knew you only as a stunt person initially. Oh, okay. So I guess my first, my, my big question would be, did you start out wanting to be more involved in that area or more as an actress? How did, and how did that all sort of shake out for you? Uh, I began as an actress. That's the roots of my training and education and entertainment is in acting. I've been uh, involved with theater since high school. Um, I wasn't always able to do a production on stage because like I was in, I was in the South. They were doing Steel Magnolias. They ain't rules for me in that. <laughs> they, they're not casting you with Shelby? No, nah, man, they tried, but they didn't think that long. <laughs> Uh, so like I've been affiliated like I would do the cinematography of it or I would be an assistant stage manager or I would like direct in my own way and contribute um, But it wasn't until college that I started the BFA program there and wound up being on stage every semester and really got a chance to like Build my creative chops in that way um, performance wise uh, So after I graduated uh, in my transition from college to New York uh, for two summers in my junior and senior year, I wound up performing in this outdoor drama in Ohio called Blue Jacket. Uh -huh. No longer in existence. Uh, it, it is, I was there for the very end. <laughs> um, but that is where I was introduced to stage combat and where I was introduced to uh, the fastest horse ride in the nation. And we burned down a fort every night. And so my, my, my affinity to fire developed then because I got to go ahead and perform outdoors under the stars and still like shoot bows and arrows as we <laughs> try to burn down a fort every night. Um, and so just like the idea of that being part of my creative life was new and exciting and I was so here for it. Um, when I went to New York, I was there as an actor, but New York is also a grueling environment for anyone in the arts. And I did all right while I was there, but I had family in LA, so I wanted to be out here, and, like get to know this side of my family more. Um, and it wasn't until I came to LA, as I was still pursuing the acting, um, I wound up being a family photographer for a little while, like specializing in documentary photography for families, and kids especially. I like, like fat faces, baby faces are fun. I was all up in there taking all the photos. Um, but it was, it was working on an episode of New Girl um, on a guest, guest star for that, that I wound up meeting my first stunt person. And I had been introduced to martial arts in the past. Uh, I, I was training in Muay Thai as like my own psychological, physical therapy. I, I don't like working out personally. I feel a lot like a hamster on a treadmill if I'm just told to run. Yes. So I, learning something is also really valuable for me whenever I'm getting an exercise. Like it needs to, I need to accidentally exercise. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, so Muay Thai and like understanding fight, distance, and range, and, and knowing how building choreography also applies to your performance on stage. They're all things that I developed at different parts of my career that all of a sudden stunts was the, like a manifestation of all the things that I kind of already knew. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't until I moved to LA that I transitioned into stunts. And so it's cool that that's where, that's how you know me. Yeah. Because I've yeah. been doing all kinds of other stuff leading up to that. I know. <laughs> I, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one stunt question and then I'm gonna shift over to acting. I, I'm curious okay. how Hateful Eight came about, just because as like a lot of people, I'm a Tarantino fan. Um, and yeah, what was the story of that? Hateful Eight was my first stunt job. Uh, my first job? <laughs> it was my first job. Uh, so, so I was working on New Girl, right? <laughs> and when I was working as an actor on New Girl, uh, the gentleman that came in to double Damon Wayans Jr. Uh, was this fantastic stunt guy who I was just picking his brain. I was like, you do stunts. How does one stunt? You stunt? Where do I stunt? Can I stunt? You a black man who does stunts. Yeah. Want to st oh. 
Uh oh. We got you. There we there go. There we go. There we I go. had a random phone call that I had to decline. Sorry, whoever that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was curious how to be involved, and he gave me what begrudging advice he had to offer in that moment. And I like threw my reel at him and was like, look, I do these things. <laughs> and he was like, okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and was very kind and patient and tolerant, but also set me on my merry way. Yeah. Uh, maybe eight months later after that, I get a call out the blue and he says, okay, so Alex, you seem to be uh, the right age and the right height and the right build. And you seem to have the right mindset for this business. So if you would like to be involved, we have a role in Hateful Eight that we're trying to fill. Are you available? Would you like to participate? And I, of course, said yes. Um, but it is also an indication and reflective of the fact that there are, is not a lot of representation in the stunt industry as a whole. The fact that like, I mean, I have a modicum of experience at that point. Yeah. Um, and they could not find another black woman available to do the job that I was asked to do in that moment. Um, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm so glad that they were willing to train me up for it. I'm so grateful uh, for the exposure, the experience and the chance to learn. Uh, but there is a lack of mentorship as a whole in this industry that uh, bears investigation yeah. because there, there are, there are, uh, there are a fair amount of people in positions of power across the stunt industry who, like the church, are not interested in self-assessment. Yeah. Uh, so that was my opportunity to step into an industry that wasn't built for me. Yeah. Um, and given that opportunity, I wanted to make sure that I made sure everyone knew that I was worthy of being there. So I've worked very hard while I've been in stunts and I've been very fortunate to continue working year after year after year to the point that stunts as a day job has been in support of my acting career and has allowed me to also pursue motion capture and more voiceover work and has been a, a means of me surviving and living off of my art rather than being beholden to a day job uh, behind a desk or serving. And I've done all of those things before. I know it's hard work. Um, so I acknowledge my privilege and my, my luck in, in finding this avenue. Yeah. Well, no, that, that's still, that, I mean, that's an awesome thing though. And to have that, to be able, I, 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 I enjoy like, I, I look at people like Zoe Bell oh. and folks like that, like who are- Zoe's dope, yeah. Who are like straddling, or like who are fully embracing both sides of that coin, like they're, full on into the stunt part of it. They're full on into the acting part of it. They seem yes. to love doing both. And mm -hmm. like, I think that that's very, that, I just find that extremely interesting. And um, yeah, there's been a lot of times across my career where people are kind of like, okay, so like you do this and you do this and you do this, but like, what do you want to be in the end? And I just never understood that question. Yeah. Because I don't see why I can't do all of these things. Why, why must I fit into this one narrow box that is that you're offering me? Yeah. Because clearly I've, I've been able to dabble in a whole bunch of stuff and do the job well. So limiting myself seems like a restriction that is unnecessary, you know? Yeah. Um, um, no, for sure. And like I, 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 I get that a lot too in terms of like, it's always like, well, do you consider yourself more of a writer or a director or something like this? Right. Like, I, I, can I not be both? Can right. Can I just be both? Like, I don't have to be one more than the other. Right. Um, so another project I want to talk to you about because it is one of the most infuriating projects I've ever watched in my life throughout, okay. which is Westworld. <laughs> Why is it infuriating for you? Oh God, I just go up and down on that show so much. Sometimes I love it, sometimes <laughs> I think it's the worst written thing on television. One of my really good friends is a production designer on it. And, okay. and so I, hearing stories and like, I don't know, the whole thing just seems like a lot of, wasted potential in a lot of ways okay yeah I, I think and um you have a you're, you're you have a very memorable i think a very pretty memorable part on that show um and in the uh i believe that was the first season right mm -hmm. yeah i believe so 
Um, what was your, how did that come about, and what was your experience on the most infuriating show I've ever watched? Uh, uh, well, my contribution to the most infuriating show you've ever watched was uh, memorable but momentary. Sure. Uh, as I have the opportunity to, because it's HBO, be a hobot in the name of entertainment. Yep. <laughs> you got uh, the book for Westworld. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I acknowledge that in the name of HBO, it was okay, and I called my father, and he was fine with it too. <laughs> I tried to check in with people, and everyone's like, "Fly, baby, fly!" So I went ahead and did my merry self. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I think the idea behind Westworld is great, man. Like, I'm a sci-fi person, so, like, I really like, I really like the potential and where this kind of narrative can go. And I get the impression that, like, the world building grew so out of control that it was hard to wrangle it and still have a nuanced conversation on what is consciousness. Yeah. Um, I, uh, oh, man, I, I just was really hoping that they'd be able to wrangle things because they just threw money left and yeah. right and left and right and it's doesn't feel sustainable in the least um given how they have to keep postponing production and now there's a pandemic so who knows what that means for the future of westworld or yeah. all of hollywood frankly yeah. yeah everything that was in production whenever it comes back is going to be like okay but do you realize the civil unrest that exists why are we like escaping back into our fantasy is how i feel about it yeah. everything has to everyone has to reevaluate their angle in my opinion yeah listen um, to black voices sorry <laughs> go ahead <laughs> oh. no that um i'm curious you've played a lot of cops alec i have yeah. you played a lot of cops a lot of uh troopers a lot of like just law enforcement in general mm -hmm. which um given the circumstances currently facing the country i find interesting and also also interested in terms of like what research have you ever done to play a cop and uh, and and how has that inform has that at all informed your relationship with law enforcement given everything that's going on right now uh, so, uh, I have investigations into cops and law enforcement is an interesting question. I have also noticed that I played a lot of cops too. Um, and I think that is a, a form of, I'll get into that. I'll get into that. Yeah. Um, so like most black children, I got sat down as a youngster by my father and was given the rundown of how to, uh, survive a cop interlude. Yeah. And an exchange with law enforcement. The whole put your hands on the steering wheel or put your arms out the window, say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, ask permission before reaching for anything and don't argue, basically. Yeah. Um, as my own little addition to all of that is I make sure that I'm playing NPR when they walk up to the window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so like that that is already a foundation of my childhood coming up. Um, I by virtue of my career in stunts and my education in martial arts, I have also met a lot of people who are cops or who have cops as family members. And so I, I see the seriousness with which they take their jobs. Um, and uh, in that way, I see uh, a great respect for what is viewed as really important work, yeah. which the core of the mission is really important work if I has if I had the impression that police were serving all the members in their community. Yeah. Um so in terms of systems of oppression, uh I feel as though entertainment and the public face of law enforcement uh as a performative act hires black faces to represent members of police departments so as to uh, normalize them and make them feel more accessible and as an attempt to uh, destigmatize the violent history of law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, it, it, is, it is an opportunity to say, look at how diverse we are, while also deflecting from the very real fact 
that uh, it's not the black cops who are typically the most violent when it comes to black communities. Although I will also acknowledge that black cops who are caught in a, uh, a power structure yeah. like the police department are likely to be influenced and uh, indoctrinated in a mindset uh, to respond in the way that police department always has. And it's rooted from slave captures all the way back to slavery. Yeah. Um, so I, I've had a lot of time uh, in the past few months reflecting on my career and acknowledging that most of the things that I have booked and worked on has been in reflection of my blackness in some capacity or another. Um, I've, I've gotten accolades and awards in New York for doing a memorable performance in Uncle Tom's Cabin as Topsy. Um, so she's like, There are so many steps in my career. I have done a children's tour all the way up the Eastern Seaboard, a two-person children's tour with a white friend of mine where I play all the slaves and he plays all the slave men, slave catchers, uh, overseers, and abolitionists. Yeah. And I am Harriet Tubman, Henry Box Brown, and Frederick Douglass doing this two-person tour to elementary schools all across the Eastern Seaboard, stopping in Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, Ohio, Flint, Michigan, and having these whole schools watch our show. And by the end of it, I remember there was this one place where I think it was in Lexington, Kentucky, where this little girl after the show in the Q&A session would ask me, so did you like being a slave? And like, that just kind of like broke my brain. Cause like not only had we just finished doing a play, so that tells me that they may not have access to the arts in that form and fashion to understand and differentiate between the two, but also the, the intentional corruption of our educational system that would lead them to believe that slaves enjoyed their enslavement. Yeah. Uh, is something that I did not quite know how to address at the time. Yeah. Uh, but the only thing that I could point out to her, this really sweet eyed blonde girl, was that, listen, there's a lot of times where people are judged for being who they are and they probably shouldn't be. I'm sure that you, blonde as you are and a girl as you are, have been judged for just the way that you look by people who make you feel bad for being blonde or being a girl. And with that in mind like you should be really careful how you judge other people based off of what you assume and what you perceive and try to take the time to really get to know the individual and like i hope and i get the impression that i kind of got through to her in that moment yeah. but that doesn't necessarily mean that i uh had the mutual support of the faculty in that moment yeah, yeah. so it's it's a weird it's a weird moment to realize that you may not be in safe company yeah yeah no for sure and yeah, that, that, that question, what a question to get from somebody. Um, Did you like being a slave? Yeah. I expected wow. you to. <laughs> yeah, you, you seem like you were having a blast. <laughs> yeah, man. The whole time, having a ball. Oh, Golly, God. you will, of <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm going to, I want to close with, one, I want to close with one question on that note. It's sure. Just, it's a question I always close with. Which, well, actually, this is kind of a two-part question. But first of all, okay. what's one project you've done which you wish more people knew about? And I'm going to tag up on that and say, what is a, for people who are wanting to become more educated and more involved, what is a good resource to do that? All right. <laughs> I, I gave you an easy one. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I have worked on several jobs that have never seen the light of day because there are systems in place that prevent them from seeing the light of day. Yeah. Um, and so the, I mean, there are parts of me that are very frustrated by where my reel is at the moment only because I know that it has, there's so much more footage to add to it. But again, it never saw the light of day. I have been the leader of the Free People's Army in video games. I have devoted a great deal of time to franchises that, uh, to, fr yeah, to entertainment that people is very are very familiar with, but may not ever get a chance to see me involved with it just because 
there are systems in place that don't want to see me in a position of leadership. Uh, so I can't directly talk on those things, except yeah. that they are absolutely things that people should know more about. Yeah. Uh, that permeates all of our entertainment between motion capture and acting and somewhat in stunts because I have been grooming myself to be an action heroine for years and still no one is really casting me in that role. Yeah. Uh, I do acting and I do stunts. I got a BFA in it and I'm nonstop working in stunts. So like, I don't understand why sure. an action heroine in front of a camera isn't an option, but here we are. Yeah. Um, there is a second half to that question. What was the second half? No, it was just, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of like how it's important for allies to get involved and how it's, uh, yes. like what's, what do you, for you, I know it's, everybody's got different things that they think are the best resources for you. What do you think the best resources are for that? Uh, I have been mostly util utilizing Facebook and Instagram stories as a place to share whatever information and knowledge that I have to offer. So by all means, use me as a launching pad to find other people as well. Uh, there are, um, I will constantly be dropping lists of people on those pages for you to follow, predominantly on my Insta stories, um, of people to reach out to in organizations. But as a starting point, White People for Black Lives and Surge, S-U-R-J, um, is a national organization that has done a fantastic job of shaping and molding allies to, uh, to understand how they want to contribute to this fight. Um, and I acknowledge that everything is overwhelming. There's a lot of information to unlearn and to relearn. Um, so the great unlearn is also another place to go to in terms of getting perspective, in terms of what our actual shared history is. Uh, Patrice is also a founder of the BLM movement and is sending out daily notifications and, um, and daily videos in terms of what has happened over the past week or day and things to be aware of. Um, and so I realized I haven't been able to share their handles. I don't want to give it to you wrong, but I do post about them all of the time on my stories. And so please come out and check it out. And you can scan through my Facebook also. And I leave information there that can direct you to other resources and other places as well. Awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to do, uh, before we do a close, I'm going to do a couple of quick pimp outs. Uh, uh, feel free to check out some of our, our reads on YouTube that Alex is in. I believe our Demon Night read is up. Our Friday yes. the 13th Part 6 read is up as well. Um, if you want to support us, you can do so on patreon.com slash scripts gone wild. Please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's about it. Thanks for chatting with me, Alex. I'm going to go ahead and throw some plugs real quick too. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Plug so, away, girl. For me, uh, I'm Alex Marshall Brown. You can find me on Instagram and on Facebook under those names. Yep. I am a Marshall Brown on Twitter. I use it less often because I'm a more visual person. Uh, also, uh, the great unlearn is something that is useful in terms of an educational resource. Uh, and in terms of organizations that I'm donating to, the Loveland Foundation specializes in providing therapy for uh, young black women specifically, but offering therapy services for people who typically don't have access to it. And when it comes to the cyclical cultural trauma that exists in black America, especially, but America as a whole, uh, I'm trying to foster uh, mental wealth programs that can help uh, mitigate that issue. Yeah, well, that's awesome. You're mm -hmm. busy. You're busy. I, I am exhausted, but motivatedly so. <laughs> well, thank you so much for chatting with me. And, Absolutely. Uh, thank you for I'll having me. And I'm sure I'll see you at the next read. Yes. Excited <laughs> about it. <laughs>